Hi, I'm Lynn Garlick. I'm the author of Binding, More Than a Motherhood Memoir. And it's more than a motherhood memoir because it is my personal story linked to the broader social, political, intellectual and creative context around motherhood. Today, I'd like to read from the book, a chapter titled Wonder Watching. My world shrank to the width of the house in the first two weeks after the birth. I spent this time wonder watching. I don't remember moving from the lounge that looked like it was sewn from the Von Trapp family curtains in The Sound of Music. I don't remember cooking or eating. I only remember the blissful feeling of Sonia's warm peanut shaped body lying across mine. She looked even smaller and more protected when she was in Andrew's strong, hairy arms. Her olive skin was the same colour as his. He sang silly rhymes to her. I'd watched the brown, downy hair covering her fontanelle, rising and falling with each pulse, because each pulse mattered. Each pulse was reassuring. I smiled at her every random suck and sigh. We had moved for a short time into the home my grandfather had built. The gordonia which my nana had planted now reached to the height of the window as if stretching to glimpse the newborn. It offered its first large flowers bowing to the ground, revealing its egg yolk stamens inside circles of white silky petals. Birdsong punctuated the day. Kookaburras started like old Victor lawnmowers trying to kick over during Sonia's first feed. Throughout the day, the rainbow lorikeets trilled in pairs around the grevillea. During the transition to golden light at bath time, sulfur-crested cockatoos screeched a cacophonous goodnight. We had joined a raucous rhythm of life growing and changing form. Time was measured in intervals of short breastfeeds. The latching on was such an unusual sensation and then I'd feel the milk rush like an internal waterfall to fill my breasts. A desert thirst immediately came to my mouth as if the moisture seemed to drain directly from my body to fill my child. Her mouth moved to a suck, pause, suck, pause, suck, pause rhythm. Andrew replenished me with glasses of water. Apparently newborns can only see to the distance of their mother's breast. The midwife also told me that babies were already familiar with what would become the breast milk. They had tasted it and smelt it because a similar substance had floated in the amniotic fluid. I believed her because Sonia latched on tightly as if she'd been waiting nine months. From the first feed and every feed thereafter, she gripped my index finger with her whole hand as if to ensure I wasn't going anywhere. The first few times I breastfed, my womb contracted as if some mechanical machine were operating inside me, rotating toothed cogs against one another that tightened internal walls. When this happened, I'd sit very still and wait to see what would happen next. I had to adjust to my maternal body as I had adjusted to my pregnant body. Vacated space inflated my belly and milk bloated my breasts. Along with baby clothes, flowers, birthing had delivered hemorrhoid stitches and other complications. All common after birth, but unknown and to me and unexpected. Nevertheless, my body, which before falling pregnant, I had viewed as inadequate in some way, too generous in parts, too stingy in others, now appeared to me as incredibly capable. My body was already nourishing life when I was still lost in the marvel of creating it. I began to appreciate my body in new ways as if it was someone else's. In fact, I was in awe of it. Previously, I'd never had a reason to think about a nipple being not just one opening, but a circle of openings. I found this out when Sonia detached herself after a feed once and milk continued to spurt at an odd angle. During such moments, I was reminded that in Greek mythology, the Milky Way was created from a spurt of Hera's milk. Hera was the goddess of marriage, women, the sky and the stars. I began to think perhaps it's not a coincidence that newborn babies have the same number of brain cells as there are stars in the galaxy. 
100 billion of them. I was to, to discover too that even the openings of a nipple swirl in the same pattern seen in the curve of a seashell, the swirl of a fingerprint, the curl of a wave and the eye of a storm. The same golden ratio as the DNA double helix of life itself. Because I was reading everything about breastfeeding, I found out that even as I was wonder watching, I was contributing to the economy. Of course I was, I was producing food that was keeping a human alive. I just hadn't put it in economic terms. Breastfeeding is estimated to contribute 3 billion to the economy each year, which is similar to the estimated contribution by the Australian movie and television production industry. However, breastfeeding isn't recognised in any economic data. Baby formula and cow's milk production is, but human milk isn't counted, even if it's sold or donated. I wondered why this was so, given the numerous benefits of breast milk for babies. Putting Wonder Watching into economic terms, the economic cost to me was about 20 hours a week of unpaid work. I hope not all my important work as a mother would be seen as unproductive by the country and have no value. I displayed the cards we'd received on the mantelpiece over the fireplace where Nana used to place crystal vases of lilies from her garden. Sometimes when Sonia fell asleep on me, I'd remain still not wanting to disturb her. When Sonia finished feeding, I'd lean her over my shoulder and feel the excess, the wetness of excess milk fall from her mouth and dribble down my back. Satiated, she'd fall asleep. Her soft heartbeat pressed gently on my shoulder. I'd remain still for as long as I could. When I did move, she'd throw her arms out melodramatically like an earthquake had struck but settled once I again settled. Because I was locked in one spot, I looked to the cards for stretches of time. It was a new experience to just sit and look and feel. My favourite cards were those drawn by my nephews and nieces as a, as a family of stick figures where we all had curly hair, even the baby, and three digit hands. Above our curly hair, they had written oversized capital letters that faced the wrong way, but looked like they were aiming to spell baby. It amused me that the other cards read, it's a girl, as if the possibilities were endless or that gender was all that mattered. I thought it odd too that congratulations is the word used to welcome a baby into the world. It isn't addressed to the newcomer. It's not a greeting or a blessing. The congratulatory message is addressed to the parents. It's the same word trotted out for acing a test, landing a job or buying a house. I pondered why there wasn't a specific word or more precise words to acknowledge the superhuman effort. the superhuman physical and emotional effort it took to deliver life. Some cards were addressed to the proud parents and it was odd to think that they were referring to us. We had gained an immediate status as if a baby capsule in the backseat of a Toyota Corolla suddenly made us accomplished. The word parent being both noun and verb loaded us up with action and potential, but child being only a noun keeps a child passive. The English language implies our child is empty until spoon fed with parenting. Our child, however, was having none of that. She was already an active participant in her own development. She dictated the routines to be followed and who was to perform them. Dad was chosen for fun and laughter, mum for cuddles and food and Nana for getting to sleep. My motherhood story could end here as motherhood stories often do, with a perfectly happy family swaddled in pastel terry toweling and smelling of breast milk. But that would be like writing a travel story while sipping cocktails in the transit lounge, never having left the airport. Thank you.